this world is built on built on hype. We have so many hype machines, and with social media and you know, eight billion people wanting to be heard, there'll always be hype, and especially around tech, there's always a lot of hype. some hype. Shitant is good. Hype drives innovation. Hype drives funding. Okay, hype drives growth. Uh, but for tech technology, which is the area that I work in, I tend to have what I call a hype to reality ratio, and it's easy to measure both actually. Okay, hype is obviously the number of posts, number of square centimeters of coverage or whatever way you want to measure that. And reality is, say, number of users, number of, you know, different ways to... Now, if you think about the metaverse, for example, okay, there was lots of hype, huge amounts of hype. Uh, but when you went into any metaverse, metaverse, you would find like 17 people there. Okay, <laughs> or 200 people there. And therefore, the hype to reality ratio was very, very, very high. In AI, it's different. Why is it different? For one, which you already said, that AI is not a new technology. It's not being, it's not come now. It's something which has matured over the last 50, 60 years. From 1956, the Dartmouth Conference. And, you know, if you kind of trace the history of AI, it's a complex history. Welcome to Inspire Someone Today podcast, a show where we dive into the stories and insights that has the power to create ripples of inspiration in your life. I'm your host, Srikant, and I'm thrilled to be with you on this journey of inspiration. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to yet another episode of Inspire Someone Today. Our guest today is a very modest and humble individual. He calls himself as a tech whisperer, and in my humble opinion, he is the giant in the technology world. And it's a great honor and pleasure to have Jasprit Bindra on this episode of Inspire Someone today. Jasprit, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, uh, Srikant. You'll find I'm not very humble as we go on. But <laughs> thanks, it's good to be here. It's great to have an industry voice to talk about a very, very pertinent topic that is doing the rounds in the world, Jasprit. So I'm so glad uh, you gave time and we are here to talk about it. Thank you. I'm looking forward to it. So Jasprit, from a career that started as a chemical engineer, you went on to do your master's in AI, ethics, ethics and society at the Cambridge University. You're the best-selling author of the Tech Whisperer book. I have been the CDO at some of the MarQ companies. Even before all of this, how was the journey for Jasprit as a kid, as a young boy? What was that you were looking for and uh, how did all of this pan out? No, Srikant, that's good you're asking me because a lot of what I'm doing now is actually was started off as a passion when I was a child. And, you know, I had to leave that passion because a career, then, you know, a corporate career means you have to kind of earn your living. You have to focus on, you have to have a narrow focus rather than, you know, doing many things. But as a child, um, right from higher secondary school, I became passionately fond of quizzing. I was never a good, good person, to be honest. We used to keep on roaming around different parts of India for me to kind of focus on a particular sport and get better. But I was always, but books would always follow you around. You could find them everywhere. And uh, somewhere along the line, I, I I used to read a lot, a lot. And somewhere along the line, you know, I got into quizzing and I became a quizzer. And that developed in me a thirst for uh, attaining knowledge and uh, uh, disseminating knowledge. And uh, I became reasonably good at it at a point of time. As I told you, I'm not going to be very humble. So at a point of time, I kind of started winning the brand equity quizzes, which used to happen many, many years back, uh, Derek mm -hmm. O'Brien. And I became the only person to win it thrice nationally, and then many others regionally, and many others. And so there was this whole passion about just learning lots of things, sometimes what were called trivia, useless things rather than, you know, useful things, which unfortunately my head is still filled with useless information rather than useful information. And that, in a sense, translated itself to my career 2.0, as I call it. 1.0 was all the things you said. I started with the data administrative services. I never was a chemical engineer. I just studied chemical engineering. And then my MBA and as a task uh, uh, officer and then with Microsoft for many years, and then the chief digital officer equivalent at Mahindra Group. So that was my corporate part, but it was the 2.0 where I'm doing a bunch of things, uh, advisory, consulting, writing the book that you mentioned, a lot of columns uh, for different newspapers, speaking, uh, teaching at Singularity at Ashoka, 
all of this has to do with knowledge. So I left my corporate job to say that I'm not going to be a typical entrepreneur. I'm going to be like, just learn for the rest of my life. And that's what I'm doing and creating a small business model around it by, by monetizing that learning uh, in different ways. Wonderful, wonderful transition out there. And between this transition between 1.0 to 2.0, was that aha moment for you? What you kind of tell me as a flipping the donut? <laughs> the flipping donut part, you know, it's just an analogy to try and describe what I'm trying to do because sometimes people found it very difficult to understand what I'm doing. And so I think of this donut, you know, you have the, a large hole in the center, so it's a slightly different donut. And uh, in your corporate life, the large hole in the center is earning, you know, you earn money and then there's a little thing of learning around it which supports the earning. I flipped it to say that the large thing would be learning and the little uh, uh, layer around it which is earning to support the learning. So, but uh, Ravi Venkateshan, who was at Microsoft and who has been a mentor of mine, then finally described what I do. He said, you have a portfolio career, so you do many things. And so, yeah, so, you know, that's what really the donut and the portfolio part is about. Yeah. And uh, Ravi was on this show and he did talk about portfolio careers. So it's good to kind of have that uh, revalidated. And in this process of transitioning, uh, just breathe. What was the challenges or what was uh, seamless for you to say that, okay, it, it is not like you gave up your corporate role on a Friday evening, Monday morning, you wake up and say that, okay, I'm not that anymore. So how easy or how hard it was and what did you do to go about making this change? It's very hard. So, you know, a lot of people, eight out of 10 people I meet, tell me, oh, you know what, I want to have a life like yours. And I am like, don't wish for it. Okay, because... Uh, you work, end up working twice as hard and earning three times as less. Okay, if it's money that you're after. Okay, because it's not, you know what, the, this word actually rewards people financially when they focus on doing one thing very well, very, very well. And that's how you kind of, you know, get financially rewarded. If you want to do multiple things and want variety, then you have to forget the financial reward part of it. As also, you always, you always need to constantly learn new things because that's what your business becomes. So I think it wasn't easy. A couple of things here. One is that, you know, when I left, I thought of the fine, I'll be learning. But what I'll do is I'll, you know, the monetization part of it will be the advisory consulting. Well, not even advisory consulting. Uh, that's not what it turned out to be. I mean, I still do some advisory and consulting, but a lot of a lot of it now comes from the thought leadership part of it, you know, speaking across the world, writing, teaching, which is not what I'd envisage. So point one is, you can't make an Excel sheet and say that, you know, this is how it's going to happen. You have to jump in and stuff happens. And the only other thing I would say is uh, because that uh, uh, the biggest barrier for most people, if not everyone, and, and Ravi again had told me that because in many ways I followed Ravi's path, knowingly and unknowingly. But the thing which hurts most people is actually the weirdest one, which is ego. Your identity becomes uh, a part of an organizational entity. You know, so identity. So, you know, you're just Bindra from Microsoft. You're not just Bindra. And when the Microsoft goes away, then you suddenly are left with um, a very tiny entity. And, and that's something which I kind of realized almost 20 years back and worked to build my own identity. And so when I left, it wasn't that difficult. You know, I had my own uh, identity. People knew me by by my name and what I did rather than what I did for other people. But that's not true for most people. And so that's what kind of makes them uncomfortable and makes them come back to an organization. Yeah, I'll pick on that piece, a very interesting point when you mentioned about working on building your own identity. And it doesn't happen overnight. What are some of those things that you consciously started doing so that you know that 10 years out or 15 years out, this is what the Jasprit Binda, Binda I want to be like? I'm going to tell you a story here, Shrikant, and um, it's not very short, <laughs> but uh, this was almost um, when I was in my late 20s, early 30s, which is very long back. I used to work with the Tata Group. I was sent for a training program, you know, which, you know, HR twists your arms and sends you. You really don't want to go, but, you know, you go L&D, they have targets, you go, okay. And, and since this was, was in Goa and in a five-star hotel, which at that time was rare, uh, I was okay. It was a five-day program, and it was one of those behavioral programs. Uh, 
But long story short, on the first day when I went there, there were a few of us in the room and no no one to do facilitator. And we were all very uh, awkward. What is this happening? Who, whatever. And we all formed a circle and someone just said that why don't we start introducing ourselves while we wait for, pe- for whoever it is to come. And so people started. I'm Srikant. I work for Microsoft. I'm just Preet. I work for Tata Group. I'm so-and-so. I work for McKinsey. I'm so-and-so. I work. It eventually came back to the end and this guy who had suggested said I'm such a and he didn't say anything after that. And all of us thought, what a loser he is. And we were all waiting. So Sachin, uh, what after that? He says, I love my daughter and I sail boats. And we were like, complete loser. Mm-hmm. And obviously, Sachin turned out to be the facilitator. Okay, And he yeah. said, look, you're all complete losers. You know, none of you have an identity. You know, you are you're completely subordinated by the identity of your organization. And you find it strange that someone else isn't. And that, I mean, I've gone to so many trainings, but that was the aha moment for me so many years back. And I started building my own identity through writing, you know, talking, social media, as when it came, blogs, all the different things which used to do it. And it takes 20, 25 years. It's not an overnight thing. Okay. Uh, these days you have people social media celebrities who get their 15 minutes of pain, sure, if you're very good looking, very rich, sure, you can do it faster. But uh, uh, it take, in the knowledge area, it takes a huge amount of time. And so again, when people tell me, oh, I want to do what you're doing, how should I do this? And I'm like, you know what, start now, maybe 15, 20 years from now, you will reach there. So that's the story. Nice story, nice segue into what we want to talk about next. You mentioned about identity. It's a real nice way as we kind of get into the next part of our conversation is the real identity crisis that is happening in the world. You are the LinkedIn top voice on artificial intelligence. What drew my attention towards you was also when there's so much of buzz happening around AI. Here is somebody who is a top voice on AI and just not AI. You're focusing more on the ethics and society of AI. So that kind of really drew my attention towards you. But before we get in there, uh, just please, this whole buzz around AI and so much of action around it, right? In the last 12 months. And similar things has happened quite a lot with a lot of tech products. And one school of thought I hear is, this is not like any other buzz hype in the past. This is here to stay. Like you said, this is not an overnight success. It has the history of the last 60, 70 years of work, it is just coming into mainstream now. But I'll let you to kind of talk about it. Is this a hype? Will it slow down? Or is it here to stay and go further from here on? Look, there's always hype. This world is built on built on hype. We have so many hype machines and with social media and, you know, 8 billion people wanting to be heard, there'll always be hype. And especially around tech, there's always a lot of hype. Some hype, Shitant, is good. Hype drives innovation. Hype drives funding. Okay, I drives growth. Uh, but for tech technology, which is the area that I work in, I tend to have what I call a hype to reality ratio. And it's easy to measure both, actually. Okay, hype is obviously the number of posts, number of square centimeters of coverage or whatever way you want to measure that. And reality is, say, number of users, number of, you know, different ways to... Now, if you think about the metaverse, for example, okay, there was lots of hype, huge amounts of hype. Uh, but when you went into any metaverse, Metaverse, you would find like 17 people there okay, or, or 200 people there. And therefore, the hype to reality ratio was very, very, very high. In AI, it's different. Why is it different? For one, which you already said that AI is not a new technology. It's not been, it's not come now. It's something which has matured over the last 50, 60 years. From 1956, the Dartmouth Conference. And, you know, if you kind of trace the history of AI, it's a complex history you'll find that actually it started even at Leonardo da Vinci's time, you know, in the 1400s or, or, or thereabouts. And so it's kind of a technology which has, uh, which has you know, gradually built itself, has had its AI winters, etc. Obviously, it came into people's, it struck people's imagination when it came from the, it, when Chat GPT in the November 2022 took it from the back room in a sense, where it was hiding and only researchers and scientists and technologists knew about it into the hands of people like you and me. And, you know, AI has been likened to electricity, not because it's a general purpose technology, but the only time you think of electricity is when it's not there. 
So you only thought of AI if it was not there. Okay, but now suddenly, you know, you could feel it, you could touch it, you could play with it. And 180 million users, which is what ChatGPT claims to have now, daily active users, is not something to be sneezed at. Uh, it means that, you know, there's the reality part also. Uh, and it's not only ChatGPT. There's other generative AI uh, now with the Sora. It's to be another ChatGPT moment, which happened three days back. It's going to have a similar impact. And then obviously enterprise AI, machine learning, deep learning. In fact, machine learning and deep learning, in my opinion, and maybe we'll talk about it, has had more miracles than uh, generative AI. Generative AI is still new and it uh, is not yet where things have happened with deep learning, etc. So to conclude, I think while there is hype, the reason why that there's a huge dose of reality here also is the fact that it's been it's been happening for a while. And it's not just chat GPT. You know, there's mm-hmm. different aspects of artificial intelligence and many of them have already start have produced some amazing results. And so therefore it's not a hype and it's just something which is, in my opinion, will change humanity forever. And is this the perfect storm moment? Because chat GPT happened. And immediately around that, there were many other stuff that happened simultaneously. Like you can talk about Brad, you can talk about Copilot and all the innovations that you kind of now start not remembering about it because that is the pace at which things are happening. So was this the perfect storm moment or it was there and that moment was Jenny and Chad GPT? Well, yes and no. In some sense, there's, there was a lot of facilitators for Chad GPT. One the fact that there's ChatGPT itself. And then, you know, the fact that there's massive social media, 3 billion plus people on Facebook, WhatsApp, whatever. So, you know, an innovation can spread this fast. Many times we forget that it's not just about creating something. The distribution is more important. And, uh, you know, there was social media to distribute it. The fact that, interestingly, this technology is not only a startup-based technology. It's incumbents will gain more from it than startups, okay? And so incumbents like Microsoft, incumbents like Google, unlike in the internet era where it was only startup, you know, the, the incumbents had no part to play in, uh, uh, in fact, they resisted it. Uh, if Netflix happened, then Blockbuster resisted it. If music happened, then all the music studios resisted it. Uh, if social media happened, the newspapers resisted it. In this case, the incumbents have embraced uh, and are actually driving it uh, in more than startups are. I mean, there would be no open AI fancy without Microsoft. You know, it's, it's backing of it and putting in all the money for the compute. So, so the whole incumbent part there and they embracing and therefore creating the co-pilots of the world and the Geminis of the world or the Lamas of the world are all incumbents. And both things are happening there. The big tech has embraced it as well as there are hundreds of startups. And plus, there's social media to proliferate it. So I think in that sense, yes, things have come together. And I call this as the cognitive revolution, just brief. Just like how we had the industrial revolution that lot many people fear and it happened to some extent also of replacing the blue-colored jobs. Now, this cognitive revolution in many circles is seen as, okay, is it going to replace the white-colored jobs? What's your take on that? Is there a risk there? And if so, how should one start preparing towards this? Yes, you're right. It's a cognitive revolution. Uh, it's not an industrial revolution. In fact, Jensen Huang, the NVIDIA founder, CEO, calls this the new industrial revolution where the product will be intelligence. Unlike food, which was the green revolution, or machinery, which was the uh, industrial revolution. But we must also remember that this is not the first cognitive revolution. We sometimes are arrogant and think, oh, AI is the first cognitive revolution. No, Uh, the Gutenberg press created a cognitive revolution. You know, when books became democratized, books were very, very precious. They used to cost a lot. You know, they were hand scribed. Uh, But the uh, Gutenberg press kind of just made it a thousand times cheaper. And a cognitive uh, uh, revolution happened. Computers did another cognitive revolution. Okay, when computing became so cheap and ubiquitous and, you know, um, so this is not the first one. And therefore, there's stuff to learn from history. And frankly, history teaches us more than most of us imagine. And in each of these revolutions, there were massive job losses, huge job losses, both in the industrial revolutions as well as in the cognitive revolutions. Of But another thing which is so one, it teaches us there are jobs. The second thing it teaches us is that the net new jobs created are always more than the jobs lost. 
always. But the third thing it teaches us is that no one is, knows a fig about what are the new jobs which are going to get created. Okay, no one knows. Uh, I mean, when the so-called social media revolution happened, started, we didn't know there would be search engine marketers or, or, or online reputation managers or even digital marketers, etc. Well, now, it, you know, it, they're everywhere. So in this case too, there are going to be job loss. They've already started. But I believe that they're going to be job created also. And what are they going to be? We have some clues, prompt engineers, uh, AI ethicists, hopefully. You know, a bunch of uh, such will, will get created. And so to conclude what I always say, and I kind of have repeated it so much that it's become synonymous with me, though I did not originate it. And I, I always tell people that AI is not going to take your job. Okay, but someone using AI will. And so please don't fear the bot, but fear your co-worker who uses the bot better than you do and therefore can do your work also besides doing her or his work and, and therefore embrace it. Be the replacer rather than the replacee, okay, in that sense. So some jobs definitely will go, but, you know, we are intelligent. We are still far more intelligent than artificial intelligence and we should use our intelligence to figure out, you know, which are, how do we kind of become better at doing stuff or doing new stuff rather than, you know, just kind of be helpless and say, yeah, it's going to replace stuff that I do. So well put. I love that statement. It's not <coughs> AI that is going to take the job, but people knowing AI are the ones taking the job. And in that light, just with what would you recommend people do to prepare themselves better? Yeah, you know, this is, as I joke with people, the third most asked question to me is, uh, will AI kill us? The second most asked is, will you take my job? But the first most asked, and encouragingly so, is how can I learn more? Where can I learn? Unfortunately, actually I see that as a gap in the market. There's, there's no one place I can tell people to go. It doesn't exist. Okay, and maybe someone should create that one thing. Okay, but uh, but uh, there you have to do multiple things. Okay, and But more important than anything is, you know, there's a human trait. Uh, and if people talk about being human in the age of AI, there's a human trait which AI still does not have, uh, which is called curiosity. Okay. And I think that is the single biggest trait that you need to have or quality you need to have. You need to be inherently curious or develop your curiosity. If you are not, you're not going to learn. And so there's so many things happening around you. Sure, you can't go learn all of those. But the great thing about most of these is, they don't need to be taught. You don't need to be taught how to use chat GPT. Like you didn't need to be taught how to use WhatsApp. There were no training programs on WhatsApp. Okay, there were no training programs on Google search. Okay, they're just so intuitive. And so is most of the stuff which is coming out there. Not all of it, but most of it. The other great thing happening is that generative AI specifically is will probably democratize programming, software programming. And you know, Rather than Nadella said this, rather than you try to learn the computer's language, the computer is learning your language. Yeah. And so, you know, and that opens up so many more things. You can start using prompt engineering to actually create stuff which only software engineers could do. And so there's no one place. You know, sure, there are lots of courses available on different uh, uh, platforms, uh, hundreds of them. The, the big techs themselves have kind of launched multiple courses. Universities have, it depends on your. Uh, your enthusiasm, you might want to do some small stuff or like me, be a little foolish and go and spend two years doing formal stuff. But you have to learn in whichever way. And there's enough out there. There's no one place everywhere. But if you don't, if you're not curious, if you don't want to, then unfortunately, you're going to be left behind. You're going to be replaced as you go. And how does Jaspeet keep pace with the pace of change? He doesn't. And I've given up. <laughs> So I'm serious. So, so I try. All of us try. I also try. And for me, it's more important because this is my passion profession now. I think I probably absorb 10% of what is happening every day. That's sometimes more than a lot of people, but still lesser than what I would like to. I um, do two, three things. One is I religiously read two general purpose newspapers, Financial Times and New York Times. A lot of the information they actually give me because a lot of the good authors, scientists write for them and they get interviewed, etc. And then that leads me to other things, you know, which I can do. That's number one. Number two, I follow a bunch of people, Twitter and LinkedIn, 
to curate stuff for me. I don't need to go out there and look for it. So if you follow Yuval Harari or if you follow Sam Altman or if you follow some of the academics, Jeffrey Hinton, etc., you know, you'll there'll be writing stuff, doing stuff. So you 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 therefore just are learning from them. So that's the second thing that I do. And the third is what I said, I do stuff formally. So if you're spending two years at Cambridge University uh, on AI ethics, obviously you learn things not only from Cambridge, what they teach you, but you know, there's so many other vistas that open out. So so uh, yeah, so it's a combination of general purpose reading, formal learning, and uh, and following people who will create things for me. But still, it's not enough. Yeah. At the pace at which the large learning models are kind of growing, yeah. anything that you do seems to be insignificant. But still, you've got to do that. Yeah. You, you see, even if you stop eating, sleeping, and work 24 hours, 7, 24 by 7 by 365, you'll not be able to keep up. So you have to accept. I know you're passionate about ethics in AI. Before we get into that particular piece, this is a very fundamental question. What does it mean to be a human in AI mm-hmm. age? You know, I don't know the answer to that also. There are many, many I don't know the answer to. And I'm, I'm trying to find that out. Of late, I have found out a, a gentleman called Paolo Benata. I don't know how to pronounce his name well. He's Italian. He's famous because he is the right person to answer that question for me because he's an AI scientist who's also a Franciscan monk, lives in a monastery. And he actually advises the Pope on uh, AI. They have done something called the Rome Declaration where they've had religious leaders from different religions coming in and, you know, thinking exactly about this. What is it to be human in the age of AI? Uh, I can make educated guesses like being curious, like I said, or being compassionate, okay, or just love. You know, you mentioned the cognitive revolution part, okay, while AI is super cognitive, there are two things it still isn't. It doesn't have emotion. And so there's something called Moravec's paradox, uh, which says that, you know, uh, an advanced AI can do many things that, uh, many cognitive things that a grown-up human being can do, but cannot do what a one-year-old baby does, okay, which is, you know, love and holding a pencil or, you know, wiggling her toes or whatever, okay. So so there are still many human things from a emotional perspective, and that's why many jobs which will not get impacted by AI will be the ones which are human. Uh, nurses, for example, okay, or construction workers, okay, or farmers, anything which involves these particular human characteristics. So definitely that one way to think about it. The other way to think about it is uh, that the other thing which even if they figure out how to build emotion into AI, I think what will be extremely difficult will be to build consciousness and therefore conscience, but consciousness. And that's a huge, huge, huge area. Uh, which uh, people are grappling with um, and people still don't know how human beings are conscious. So therefore knowing how to make a conscious is even more difficult. So I think these consciousness and emotions are the two big areas which uh, AI is not. Even though famously Chad GPT professed love to a New York Times reporter, uh, it was just the same things which I had learned from the internet rather than actually feeling uh, that particular emotion. Great. So let's get into the core of the conversation that something is a top of mind for everybody, particularly the communities and the governments, which is AI changes and what's happening. What does that mean to our countries, communities and people at large? Mm, I'm still waiting for uh, the question because that is a very, very wide (laughs) thing to talk about. But uh, I'm happy to talk about that or if there's any specific I think specifics is, I think the recent phenomenon that we are seeing is around deep fakes. Yeah. Right? And, and with the two big democracies in the world going in for elections, how significant would that be? Where does AI and ethics play a role in managing that or curtailing that element of uh, deep fakes uh, that, will, that would potentially impact the democracies and the countries? Yeah. So, you know, 80% of my work is still in boring AI, which is enterprise AI and you know, use cases and things like that. And it needs to be done. But the but the other 20%, and hopefully that will become larger, is on the more than even the ethics of AI is the philosophy around AI. My core interest area, actually, and I'll come to deep fakes, my core interest area over the past, what drew me to do this course at the university, etc., 
was not as much the ethics part, but even behind it, larger than it, which is the philosophy uh, around this technology. And my dissertation had to do with Vedanta and AI, which we can talk about later. But the ethics is probably more complex than building a large language model. Okay, um, much more difficult to solve than to solve building a chat GPT, though however miraculous it was. And again, this is not the first time that we are faced with this question. Every fundamental new technology or GPT, not chat GPT, but a general purpose technology, has had a dark side. You start with fire. We forget. People used to fear fire more than use. And fire is inherently very destructive. So is electricity. Super destructive. It can kill all of us. Frankly, so are motor cars. You know, if you just let motor cars uh, roam around without any standards or guardrails, we'll have millions of people dying in accidents every day. And then famously nuclear technology, which we know. So every technology has its ethics part and we have learned how to deal with it. And all these areas that I mentioned, the nuclear part is still not 100% dealt with. And so in a way, I'm optimistic that we will learn how to deal with AI uh, and we can talk about that separately. But many ethical conundrums around AI, I think while people fear the Terminator one the most, to me, that's the least of the issues where they act kill us all, etc. Uh, there are some very big here and now problems. And the biggest of them this year, we were talking of perfect storm, okay, is the deep fake issue. And deep fake not only do damage personal reputations, which is what it is being largely used for pornography, women's reputations, but to subvert democracy itself. And the perfect storm, the three things which are happening this year, which have made it a perfect storm is one, just how easy it has become to make deep fakes. Deep fakes are not new. We have had deep fakes for the last 10 years or approximately. But it's become super easy and Sora will make it even easy. Okay, but one, two, bigger problem in my opinion, how easy it has become to proliferate deep fakes. Okay, uh, you can create as many deep fakes as, as you want, but if you have no distribution mechanism, no one other than you is going to see it. Okay, so that, and then obviously third, that half the world goes for elections this year. Uh, including the world's largest democracies. So this year, 2024, will actually show us whether we can manage AI or not. And at this point of time, it's not as much about how AI will prevent this happening as much about how AI will actually make this happen. You know, all the subversion of democracy, etc., etc. I have a lot more to say on this, but this is the perfect storm and, you know, we can get deeper into this if you want. But... Uh, 2024 is a very crucial year for from this particular ethical aspect of AI. And there are others which we have to deal with. Because at the very fundamental of it, it also is the trust at question, right? The whole uh, defects thing is about what, what do you trust, what you don't trust. And that kind yeah. of leaves everybody in a conundrum saying that, yeah. okay, which is real, which is not real. Yeah, that is in fact a bigger issue, uh, as big an issue. I mean, you know, now there are instances where now politicians have started claiming the truth to be a fake. Not only, you know, it's, a, it's not about fake being a truth, which is what deep fakes tend to do. But anyone who says something which is not the right thing says that, you know what, this wasn't me. This was a deep fake. So you don't know what to trust. Any advice for people interested in this field? What do they need to do to get uh, deeper and get broader into what's happening around this? Oh, absolutely. I, I really wish and hope, uh, Shikant, that everyone gets interested into this as much as they're interested into, you know, the the Sora, Chat GPT, all the other tools and doing some cool stuff with that. Because this whole deepfake or other ethics issues, bias, privacy, uh, environmental impacts of uh, large language models, etc., are not going to be solved only by regulation. There will be regulation. It will help, but it's not going to solve uh, there will be technology, counter-technology, okay? Uh, and there will be an arms race, virus, antivirus kind of thing. Uh, but that also isn't going to solve it. What will solve it will be a, at a, I will only, can only happen at a societal educational level where people realize that these problems are there and, you know, they study them and they kind of look at them and they are aware about them. I mean, if you think about, and there are many instances, you think about smoking, for example. Everyone used to smoke. Smoking was cool. Like chat GPT is cool. But then, you know, people discovered there was the other side of it also. And, you know, there's this whole education over many years which kind of reduced smoking. I, I talked about vehicles. The fact, I mean, 
what people stop at a red light there's nothing which makes them stop there's no policeman on every red light okay but we made standards and people followed those standards more importantly drive on the left stop at a red light okay x this y give indicator many don't follow it in india is a different matter but you know we've put guardrail standards and people follow them at a societal level and so and in ai too we will need something similar okay and so i think everyone should and i in fact have been propagating that the curriculum for schools and colleges needs to change to incorporate this it has already started happening in certain countries nordic countries where in um, primary school students are taught to dis- discern with their naked eye what could be a face deep fake and not it's still possible if you really look closely uh, even at sora videos many of them you can know that is a ai generated video and so it will need to be both formal and informal in corporates you know much like you have sexual harassment trainings and financial fraud related training etc you will have to have this so it will have to happen at every level i therefore hope that it, everyone really gets it let's say very good call out this is still the coming of age of the new technology the guardrails will have its own place in the due course and this skepticism is good as long as it helps accelerate what is found which is for the larger good and those guardrails will definitely help the misuse of this great okay here we are with just bit of all the things ai we are into the power of three round the first of the power of three question just speak to you what are the three use cases that ai ai has that has the potential to solve for big world problem potentially uh, it can help us solve global warming by trying to help us discover nuclear fusion which as human beings we have not been able to uh, ai also has the potential to model climate and weather and help us again do the right interventions uh, for again for global warming which i believe is our number one uh, biggest uh, problem uh, and with generative ai i think it has the power to make every single human being a creator and create and therefore hopefully try and solve the world's unemployment problem those are the booming creator economy absolutely three courses or book recommendations to familiarize with ai or any new technologies in the horizon well you know there's this nice book called the tech whisperer i've heard a little about it okay <laughs> i read it who the author is i don't know we have to look it up but it uh, even while it was written 4 years back it still has a lot of good stuff about ai and the three and other technologies but anyway, keeping that aside i think you will know how harari's both books uh, uh, homo sapiens as well as homo deus are great readings for this uh there's a book called uh, the atlas of ai which is not so well known by kate crawford which i would definitely recommend there are many others but i will stop since i have to give only three okay thank you just pick three ai companies or trends to watch out for <laughs> i think that is easy right <laughs> so um i think three ones i would watch and they they'll involve the trends also in that sense so obviously open ai it's kind of leading the generative ai mega trend the second one would be deep mind now google deep mind uh, which I would watch not for generative ai as much as i would watch for deep learning where it is done some amazing work and the third very counterintuitively is actually meta primarily because they are the largest company working on open source ai and they have adopted open source with uh, llama and checkrand and and then these open source models potentially can become bigger and more powerful than the proprietary models like chat gpt so those would be the just with you do yourself a lot of podcasts lot of uh, interviews if you were to have three individuals on your show yeah. who would those three individuals be well i think we've already um, kind of it refers back to uh, the names which i've already said i mean i am a deep admirer of you all arari some people don't like him but i think he he brings perspectives which others don't so he would be one jeffrey hinton would clearly be and actually jeffrey hinton would be the first one and uh, he's kind of the godfather of deep learning ai in many ways and he's a very wise man and the third one actually would be a guy called gary marcus gary also writes amazing stuff about uh, ai is a professor in canada actually both jeffrey hinton and gary marcus are from canada which is very interesting but gary marcus always brings the contrarian view totally contrarian he's not an optimist 
Uh, and so I think the three of them would have quite an interesting chat. I would pay a lot of money to get it. Nice guest list. So if Jaspreet were to give three advice to your future self, what would the three piece of advice be to your future self? Well, one is to uh, go and learn more earlier than I thought, earlier than I did. So I still had a corporate career of 20, 25 years before I moved into this space. And I would have definitely done that earlier. Uh, number two, uh, Actually, would have been to, which is actually my number one advice. I gave it to every student, no one listens. Okay, is to act that the two most important subjects are not math, well, maths maybe, but are not physics, chemistry, biology, maths, engineering, whatever, are actually philosophy and history. Philosophy and history. And I repeat for the third time, philosophy and history. And I would have, I didn't study either of them. Well. I, I started studying them very, very late in life. They are the real subjects which govern all of these technology science are all subsets of philosophy okay and so so i think those that would be my other advice and because i've said it twice those are my three advice <laughs> <laughs> nice the last of the power of three what are three micro experiments that you would recommend to make everyday learning a habit i think uh having a routine is very important and you know in that routine you know when are you that you are actually learning i usually have the time set out and the second is I actually set that out on a calendar so it's good to calendarize stuff and you know say that in this time you'll be learning experimenting etc and the third is not a micro experiment but I think the best learners are the people who read most and reading is a lost art uh, now everyone only reads small stuff no long form everyone watches videos rather than reading I think uh, reading gives you much more learning than any other way to absorb content. So you still suggest that, given that we are talking so much of Gen AI? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You will you'll not be able to produce anything useful from AI unless you know what to ask. it. And therefore, asking right questions. You know, we used to say that since our school, that, you know, ask the right questions rather than the answers. And I think Gen AI is really that, teaching you to ask the right questions. Absolutely. It's not the answers, but the questions that matter here. Absolutely. Yeah, that's right. Wonderful. Just wait, thank you so much for being a sport in this part of three round. As we get closer to the home run, uh, just wait. What's next for just wait? You know, I learned many years back, uh, you can not to make too many plans. Okay, you need to have like what you want to do and try and do that. But I know that I will continue learning. So, you know, while I finish this course, uh, this course has, uh, the Cambridge one has made me far more interested in philosophy and uh, the regret that I don't know anything about it uh, or very less about it. And so I think I'll, I'll probably my next formal learning will be around philosophy. philosophy. That much I know. I want to write another book. I've been lazy about it. And so hopefully, hopefully that. And hopefully more of teaching, which uh, again, I do very sporadically, not enough. So yeah, they're all knowledge areas. That's basically it. I think there's no big hard objective in that sense. That's no surprise there that you are focusing on the knowledge element of it. If you could change one thing about your industry, what would that be? You know, the funny thing is I have no industry. So people ask me, what is your industry? I'm like, mm. I have no idea. That, so if you, at a very high level, if you say that the industry is technology, I think the one thing I would change, and I know I, I sound like a broken record now, and it's already changing, is that I would have more humanists than technologists. I know uh, engineers and technologists like us have screwed up the world by creating all these technologies, frankly, in the wrong way, social media being one. If we had more philosophers and humanists in it, it would have gotten created in a totally different way. And people have started doing that. Google, Microsoft, etc. have music, they hire musicians now, they hire humanities people, uh, they had philosophers. So some of it has started changing, but I think it should happen far more. And what have been the most helpful resources that has helped you along the way that people who are listening to this, they take uh, attention to this and say, okay, probably this is where I would want to kind of start as well. Well, I don't think the World Wide Web is the right answer to this. <laughs> okay, but it's certainly one. It's democratized knowledge, right? And, you know, earlier on, it was so difficult. To, uh, I, in some sense, the Kindle has also been one because I, I, I can, you know, the biggest problem that I used to have is I would know of a book, but I wouldn't 
by the time I go get around to buying it from a physical bookshop, I would have forgotten about it, or it would be too expensive. But with the Kindle, I can immediately buy, and uh, probably that. Uh, so I, I I don't know whether these are good answers, but that's what really helped. Wonderful, Jasprit. This has been a good uh, knowledge flow for what's happening in the uh, world today, particularly with AI being front and center of it, and you being one of the proponents of it. Thanks for sharing your views. I'm sure a lot of our listeners would benefit from it. Would have a lot more questions. Before we sign off, uh, this show is all about creating ripples of inspiration. What's your inspire someone today message to all of our listeners? I think uh, we've got one life. I realized one day when I woke up that I'm going to die. Uh, all of us are going to, and so try and do the things you want to do. In my case, it was learning new stuff. Uh, just don't follow the herd because everyone is doing a particular thing and. Right, going up in a or down in a particular way. Uh, that's not what life was meant for. It was meant to do what you really want to do, and and you don't need to. I mean, you don't need to have be a millionaire, etc., to do this. And a lot of times you can do stuff. And therefore, finally, have your own identity. Don't subordinate your identity to an organization or an entity or another person. That's a great summary. We come full circle. We started off saying, "Where is the identity?" To- Kind of wrap it up, saying that build your own identity. Uh, this is not about uh, what you want to do. It's one life. Create your own path. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Inspire Someone today. This is Srikant, your host, signing off. Until next time, continue to carry the ripples of inspiration. Stay inspired. Keep spreading the light.